If you collect Roman coins, it's quite likely that you have a coin from this guy here, Emperor Philip, also known as Philip the Arab. Despite his short reign between 244 and 249 AD, Philip issued an enormous quantity of coins, and for a series of reasons that we'll get into shortly, a lot of them have made it to our days, making the coins of this man some of the most affordable Roman imperial coins of good silver that you can find on the market now. And since so many of us collectors own one of his coins, how about I tell you a bit of his story? How was his reign? Why so many coins of Philip have made it to our days? Did he strike coins for other members of his family? How did his reign come to an end? You will get all of these answers in this video, so let's get started. Philip was a provincial, hailing from the province of Arabia Petria in the Roman Far East. He enlisted in the Roman military and climbed through the ranks. Philip must have been either very well connected, as some sources indicate that he came from a local elite, or a truly competent soldier, because in 243 AD he was the Praetorian prefect of the, em the previous emperor, Gordian III. A year later, in 244 AD, Philip accompanied Gordian on his campaign against the Sassanid Empire. Shapur, the Persian king, defeated Gordian in battle, resulting on the Roman emperor's death. Some say he died in battle, while others claim his soldiers, furious after the defeat, killed Gordian, hailing Philip as the new emperor. Philip, of course, accepted the ascension to emperor. He quickly signed a peace treaty with Shapur and retreated to Rome to solidify his new position. The coins issued by Philip did not change much in relation to those of his predecessor. The Antoninianus, or double denarius, was the only silver coin struck regularly, as inflation had made the issue of the single denarius unprofitable for the Roman mint. Although some, some rare instances of denarii were made for ceremonial issues, the silver content is around the 40% mark, maybe slightly less later in his reign. Well, this gets us to one of the main questions of this video. Why are the coins struck in his reign just so common? Well, that's a bit of a multi-layered answer. The first reason has to do with the sheer number of coins that were made to start with. The 3rd century AD saw the budget of the Roman state stretched to its limits with the sheer number of troops it had to maintain. Not only to fight the multiple foreign wars Rome was fighting most of the time, but also the constant civil wars that happened in this century. Older coins with higher silver content were constantly recalled and reissued as new debased ones, and this mountain of coins was, of course, used to pay for lots of troops and as bonuses for soldiers to win their loyalty. Let's remember the army was by far the largest expenditure the imperial treasury had to take care of, so it's not surprising to see that this period saw massive numbers of coins issued, and as a result, many have reached our days. Another important reason had to do with hoarding. The Romans living in Philip's time did not know how bad things were going to get in the next three decades or so. A Roman who was, let's say, 25 years old at his reign, definitely must have noticed a bit of an inflationary trend, with prices rising compared to previous years. This person also must have noticed the increasingly tense political situation they were living in compared to previous decades. And despite the debasement, let's be frank, a 40% silver coin is still a respectable coin, with 50% silver being a reality for at least the previous 50 years, so no one really knew better coins than 50%. So we can clearly see that there were lots of signs of uncertainty in the horizon, and this must have stimulated people to hoard coins as much as they could. Sadly, a lot of these people that were hoarding did not come back to retrieve their coins. They, they were right, bad times were coming. As a result, lots of coins were left in jars and pots, leading to the abundance of coins we have today. So let's have a look at a common Antoninianus of Philip. This example is from the Roman Mint, dated between 247 and 249 AD. Pretty nicely sculpted bust of the emperor here. He had a pretty strong jawline, as we can see. Notice the short hair and closely trimmed beard. 
you will see a lot of emperors with this hairstyle during the 3rd century, as this was the standard haircut of the Roman army. And since most emperors of this century came from the ranks of the army, well, that will typically become the norm. The legends are pretty straightforward. Imperator Philippus Augustus. The autocratic nature of emperors in this century led many of them to completely ignore the old titles given by the Roman Senate, such as Tribunicia Potestas, Pater Patria, among others. The only titles you will often find in coins are Imperator and Augustus. Imperator meaning commander-in-chief of the army, and Augustus, of course, meaning emperor. Basically, they wanted to give you, the reader of this coin, two very clear messages. I'm in charge, and I have lots of soldiers by my side. On the reverse, however, we have a more benign message. We have Anona, the personification of the grain doll the emperor gave to the poor citizens of Rome. This early version of a social program was absolutely crucial for the massive population Rome had at the time, close to a million people, and disrupting this free distribution of grain could quickly lead to massive revolts, so the emperor always took it very seriously. We can see on the design the goddess Anona carrying some wheat stalks, and next to her the small prow of a ship, since all of Gr Rome's grain arrived via the Tiber River, carried upstream from Rome's port city of Ostia. On the legends, we read Anona Augustoris, translating to the Anona brought to you by the emperors. Notice a plural here, emperors. That's, why this, that's because this piece was struck later in his reign, when Philip reigned with his son as co-emperor. He was called Philip II. And since I just mentioned his son, how about we look at some of his coins? Young Philip II was just 7 years old in 244 when his father became emperor. Despite his young age, he was raised to the position of Caesar, the heir to the throne, in a clear show that Philip wanted to form a dynasty. This piece here was made when Philip II was a Caesar, so between 244 and 247, and it is also from the Mint of Rome. On the obverse, we have the bust of young Philip. He actually doesn't look like a 7-year-old here, he kinda looks older, but in any case, definitely a younger portrait if we compare it to his father's. I guess making his image a little bit older was meant to make people take him a bit more seriously. The legends are also pretty straightforward, Start stating his regnal name, just like that of his father. It reads, Marcus Julius Philippus Caesar. Now on the reverse, <laughs> wow, that must have been a bad day at the mint. This coin isn't worn, it came out of the mint looking, looking horrible like that. We start seeing a trend of worsening quality control on coins, starting around Philip's reign, which will only get worse in the following decades. The obverse die in this coin was quite fresh, but the reverse die is completely busted by excessive wear. The image is mushy and it's hard to make out the details. This reverse die should have been replaced but, as we can see, it just kept being used way past its prime. In any case, with some Photoshop magic we can figure out what was supposed to be on this reverse. Here we have a standing portrait of Philip standing as the Principi Juventutis, the first among the youth, a title generally given to Caesars or young emperors who had recently ascended to the throne. Here we have Philip holding a spear and a globe, showing his right to rule, and around the design the legends, Principi Juventutis. Now let's check out one of Philip II's issues as emperor. In 247 his father, seeing war looming in the horizon once again, and knowing the situation would soon become unstable, raised young Philip, who was just 10 at the time, to co-emperor. Of course no one expected him to do anything of importance, but in any case, this was a move, on his dad's part, to increase his legitimacy. This particular piece was struck between 247 and 249, year when both father and son met a violent end at the hands of his successor. Here on the obverse, we see an older looking bust of Philip II. Remember, he was just 10 at the time, but here we have a portrait where he basically looks like a young adult. The legends show that despite being just 10, the young Philip was already hailed as Imperator. As you can read, Imperator Marcus Julius Philippus Augustus. On the reverse we have Sol Invictus, the sun god, a deity very popular with the soldiers. 
This is a clear move to gain favor with the army, showing that Philip Sr. was concerned that, that, making, that he would make sure his son would follow his footsteps in the military. On the legends, it reads, Aeternitas Imperi, which we could loosely translate to the eternity of the empire, the eternal rule of the emperors. The sun god was also closely tied to this idea of something immutable, of undying things. That's why we commonly find his image with legends that pass this idea of an undying empire, an undying rule, eternity. The most interesting event on Philip's reign was Rome's 1000th year of its founding. 21st of April, 248 AD, marked the 1000th year of the Roman calendar, a millennium since the legendary founding of the city by Romulus. This event was celebrated with a series of lavish games called the Ludi Seculares. According to sources, the city was decorated from top to bottom. The Circus, Circus Maximus and the Colosseum were jam-packed for days of continuous games and festivals. More than a thousand gladiators and hundreds upon hundreds of, of exotic animals died in the arena. A fascinating series of coins was issued to celebrate the event. The reverse of these special coins featured all sorts of interesting animals that must have been on display in the arena, such as elephants, lions, rhinos, gazelles. They really wanted to advertise in as many ways as possible how spectacular these games were going to be. So let's have a look at one of such coins. Here we have an Antoninianus struck in the name of Philip Sr. Let's quickly go over the obverse, it is, as it's just like the other coins, with the bust of the emperor and the legends, Imperator Philippus Augustus. Heading to the reverse, we don't have an animal here, but that's still part of the commemorative series, since we can read on the legends, Secularis Augustorum. The games were officially called Ludi Seculares, or the secular games, since they were meant to be celebrated once every century, or as the Romans called it, a seculum. As for the design in the middle of the reverse, we have a kippus, a small altar that where a priest would make offerings to the gods. Despite the image we have today of the Romans being this highly urbanized, highly advanced and logical civilization, we can't forget that they were actually very religious, as religious as any other civilization from that time. State affairs and religion were inseparable, and the emperor had a series of religious obligations he had to follow such as rendering proper cults to the gods. At the center of the altar, we have the abbreviation Consul Tertium, celebrating Philip's third year as a consul. Now, every emperor, worth his salt, wanted to establish his own dynasty, and for that, he needed to be married to a good, traditional Roman wife. And with Philip, it was no exception. He was married to Otacilia Severa, a noblewoman from a well-established, very old family whose lineage dated back to the 5th century BC. She was declared Empress, or Augusta, by Philip upon his ascension. There are no records of anything noteworthy done by her, and after her, her husband and her son died, she was allowed to live in obscurity. But if there is something noteworthy about her, is the quality of the coins struck in her name. I love this coin, it's just so pretty. I particularly like the portrait. Her facial features definitely look properly feminine, while on other coins featuring empresses, in, especially in the 3rd century. The portrait is basically the, the same as the emperor, it's just that the emperor is wearing a wig. In here, it looks like a proper woman. On the legends, we can read her regnal name. Marcia Otaquilia Sewera Augusta. No official titles other than Augusta, Empress, as, of course, back then women were not allowed to take any kind of exec executive public office. Coins dedicated to empresses often had very feminine motifs on the rivers, and here's no exception. Here we have Pudicitia, the incarnation of what Romans considered the ideal virtues of a woman, that is, femininity, to be a good housewife, to be chaste. We see the goddess sitting on a throne, and she has a veil over her head, which she is lifting. Now, something interesting. Just like the coin of Philip II as Caesar I showed you previously, notice the stark contrast of sharpness between the obverse and the reverse. 
This coin is yet another case of a reverse die being used way past its prime, paired up with a very fresh obverse one. So, looking only at Antoniniani is getting a little bit monotonous, so how about a coin struck in the provinces? This is a tetadrachma struck at Antioch, the empire's third largest city and the main city of the Roman Far East. Before the arrival of Rome in this region, it was controlled by the Greeks for centuries. They used a different set of denominations, and when the Romans arrived, they found a system so well established that, well, they just continued issuing it, merely changing the visual elements for the coins that matched the imperial propaganda, but the denominations, they just stayed as they were. The reign of Philip was very, a very unstable one in the East. It began with a war against the Persians, and even if he managed to strike a peace deal, the number of troops required in the East was always very considerable, which led to the need of issuing lots and lots of coins to pay for such a big number of troops, resulting in these big tetadrachma here being nearly as common as the Antoniniani from the Imperial Mints, and one of the most affordable tetadrachma you can currently buy on the market. This example was struck in the name of Philip II, and it's quite similar to those struck in the name of his father. The only way of distinguishing one from the other lies in the emperor's portrait. Philip Sr. has a wrinkly face, particularly on the forehead, while Philip II shows a younger bust, as we can see here. As for the legends, on both cases, of Philip I and II, the legends all, always make a reference to Senior Philip, so they always give the Senior Philip's titles. It reads, Autocratoros Marcus Julius Philippos Sebastos, which is word for word a translation of what we could find on an Imperial Mint Antoninianus in Latin, that is, Imperator Marcus Julius Philippos Augustus. On the reverse, we have this big, imposing eagle with its wings open, a very common design for coins struck in Antioch. Under the eagle, we have the word Antioxia, showing this coin was struck at Antioch, and around the design, we have a continuation of the obverse legends. Now, this time, it tells us the official titles held by Philip. De Marcos Exousias Hupato Delta, with Tribunician Powers, Consul for the Fourth Year. The consular year allows us to pinpoint this coin to between the years 248 and 249, so right at the end of his reign. And since we just mentioned this coin was made in the last of his regnal years, it begs the question, how did Philip's reign end? In 249, the situation at the borders was starting to flare up once again. A Gothic army had invaded the provinces of Moesia and Thrace, while Germanic tribes attacked Pannonia. Also, on top of that, two generals, Jotapianus and Pacatianus, stationed at the borders, also rebelled and declared themselves emperors. Overwhelmed at the situation, Philip dispatched a senator with military experience, Gaius Messius Decius, to quell the rebellion and expel the barbarians from, from the Roman territory. He was successful, but the troops, discontent with Philip's administration, hailed Decius as emperor. Decius accepted, marched upon Rome, and decisively defeated Philip in battle. Some say both Philip and his son died in battle, others claim only the senior Philip was slain in battle, and his son was quickly killed off back in Rome when news of Decius's victory arrived at the capital. And so, the reign of Philip, yet another soldier emperor from the 3rd century, ended in what would be a long, violent and terrible century for Rome. Do you have a coin from Philip the Arab? Let us know in the comment section down below. I hope you enjoyed this little episode, leave a like and consider subscribing if you did, happy collecting, and I'll see you soon.